Welcome back. I'm Brandon, the HBAR Bull, once again joined by Zepsi. We both do some contract work for the HBAR Foundation, but we don't do these weekly updates in any official capacity. We're just coming to you personally to give you the latest in the Hedera ecosystem. Welcome, Zep. How's it going, Brandon? It is going pretty good. Uh, we have rocky markets there in the crypto space, but we have a lot of great stuff to go over in the Hedera ecosystem. But as always, none of this is financial advice. Use it for entertainment or educational purposes only. So the first thing I wanted to get into are the implications for Hedera of both Bitcoin and Ethereum networks experiencing high levels of congestion. You know, the Bitcoin fees have been as high as $30 over the last week, and the transaction fees are still elevated. This has been due to to the ordinals or their version of NFTs. And, you know, the Bitcoin block every 10 minutes can only handle one megabyte of data. So if you start clogging that up with JPEGs, you can see how that can start to cause an issue. And, you know, because of that clogging, there's a lot of transactions that just aren't getting processed uh, and so forth. Now, with Ethereum, you would think with congestion happening on both of these networks that the Ethereum fees would be elevated because of something similar, but it's not. It's because of another meme coin craze. Of course, we go through phases like this on a regular basis, whether it's AI or whether it's DeFi or whether it's meme coins. We've seen that over and over again. Hedera usually catches a bid when we're going through like a, an institutional adoption phase and those coins that are focused on, on enterprise uh, catch a bid. But right now, meme coins are going through their phase uh, uh, we see Pepe out there. They're bringing all kinds of new meme coins online as well. And because of that, you know, we're seeing those five to forty dollar fees on Ethereum. And, you know, just from the scaling issue, from the fees, this should at some point bring some attention to Hedera. Hedera, of course, right now can process 10,000 transactions per second, and that's in a throttled state. If we lifted that throttle, we could handle many tens of thousands of transactions per second. And, and of course, we've also talked about how Hedera is designed to be sharded. So you could break the network into pieces. Each of those could handle those tens of thousands of transactions per second. And then those can communicate between one another. And essentially allow for unlimited scaling. So that allows us to have super low fees. We're the most efficient network on earth, uh, and that's going to garner some attention. But we're also seeing some effects of centralization due to this congestion that we wouldn't see on Hedera. What happens when we have these high fees is people are like, well, how can we scale these networks? And, and the first thing they uh, start to bring up is layer two solutions. Well, we'll just throw a layer two solution on top of it uh, and that should fix our issues. Well, unfortunately, most of these layer two solutions are uh, very centralized. So that even though from a theoretical standpoint, Bitcoin and Ethereum might be very decentralized, once you start to add these layer two solutions on top of them, it makes them more centralized. We've talked about the practical versus actual decentralization in the past when we talk about miners in the case of Bitcoin, where Yes, you might have thousands of miners, but if it gets consolidated into three or four mining pools, those mining pools are the ones who end up having the power and making the decision. Well, this is a similar example where Hedera can scale at that native layer. It doesn't have to worry about layer two solutions. We don't have to worry about the layer two centralization that it brings. What are your thoughts, Zeb? When you look at something like Bitcoin, and you know, to me, it's like, in my personal opinion, they should you know, be avoiding these ordinals altogether which of course needs some kind of centralized authority again. You know, they need those core developers to come together and say, right, we're gonna, whatever we're gonna do, we're gonna update it to whatever that means, but to remove the instances of the ordinals. And that's what I think they should do. But again, that's a massive, you know, display of centralization for what is supposed to be the most decentralized network in the world. So not only then is it getting congested, but the only way to fix that is again through centralization, which is of course the biggest sort of piece of FUD that is thrown at us again and again. And I think this just highlights the massive misunderstanding of what centralized means and, you know, the benefits and negative traits of that centralization. Every network needs an element of centralization somewhere. We don't want it to be more centralized than decentralized, but we want to have something in check so that when things like this happen, resolutions can be made. This is sort of a, a testament to the misunderstanding of what decentralization is across Web3. But when you look towards something like Ethereum, last weekend I spent, I think, about $90 on gas fees for one transaction. Bear in mind, I had two other transactions that didn't go through, both at $30. So what, that's $150 in gas for one transaction. And of course, 
what this transactions are for, what these higher gas fees is for, is to be put to the front of the queue for your transaction to go through that you could get the best deal. And again, what this highlights to me is that Ethereum and, and every other DLT really fails at the first core principle of what a you know ledger, i.e. a distributed ledger, ought to do. And a ledger throughout time has been there to create a fair order of transactions, an order of transactions that you can cite and know that you know one transaction happened before another, someone owes someone money or whatever it is, but to know that that order is there. And on Ethereum, you can pay for that ordering, which of course, for a, a network that preaches economic sort of liberation or whatever it is, that is the biggest downfall a network could possibly have. If you endow the richest users on the network to get the better deal over the poorer, that is, that is no improvement on the current financial system whatsoever. And so again, what it highlights to me, like I just said, is that a lot of these ledgers fail at the first hurdle, which is fair ordering. And that is, of course, one of the main features of Hedera is this you know, ABFT, fair ordering events, you know, the Hedera consensus service and so on and so forth. So even when you look at what Ethereum has failed at, i.e. being a ledger, fair ordering events, and you look at what Bitcoin has failed at, i.e. wanting to be this sort of mass decentralized body that actually turns out needs an element of centralization uh, to be a payment network. When you even put those flaws aside, you've got to realize that this is happening on these networks before they've even scaled. You know, Ethereum is doing what, 12, 12 TPS, whatever it is. Um, Polygon, of course, is their solution to that alongside some others. But even Polygon hasn't proven to work at scale. The only ledger that is proving itself at scale on mainnet is Hedera. A thousand TPS we sustained for however many hours. You know, we've been averaging at what, like 700 to a thousand TPS. That is on our mainnet. We are doing that now. And there hasn't been any rise in fees and there hasn't been any congestion. What happens if Polygon is in the future and it gets right, we suddenly need a thousand TPS. Of course, the gas fees will rocket, but can it even handle that TPS? We have no idea. And so for me, you know, all of this does is highlight A, the fundamental principle of Hedera as a ledger, fair ordering. It's an economic system that supports everyone through fixed fees. There's no front running but also that it is the only network that has proven itself at scale. And I think as Zenobia mentioned recently, as we have high profile use cases coming online with high fruit throughput, and this gets tested again and again and again, and Hedera continues to scale, institutions are only going to trust the ledgers which have proven themselves on mainnet. And of course, at the moment, that is only Hedera. So I think, yeah, a lot of bad news in Ethereum and Bitcoin, but a lot of good news in terms of Hedera and what that shows us. And also, you know, it might show that Hedera might be the best layer two solution for some of these other networks. We certainly do believe in a multi-chain world in the future. It's going to happen, but Hedera might offer some of those solutions as well. And you say, you know, there needs to be an element of centralization. I think that goes back to why the founders of Hedera focus so much on uh, governance. Right. They, they saw what happened with the hash wars in 2017 and they said, we have to have a way where we can upgrade our network and make decisions without affecting decentralization too much. And that's where the council came from. Right. A bunch of experts that come through that are decentralized across industry, across geography, across time that can make effective, good decisions for the network. All right. So the other thing we wanted to get into is Ethereum. One of its strengths is its ecosystem. Right. It has all of these different things that are being built on their network that can leverage off of each other. And we're starting to see that in Hedera as well. And we have a great example. I talked to the founder of Aniseed, who's working with game developers in our space and coming up with some really interesting stuff. So listen in. Duncan, can you tell us what Aniseed is and the history behind it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Aniseed was the first, actually the first charity NFT marketplace to exist back a few years ago before, I guess, NFTs really took off, particularly NFTs for charity. We worked alongside primarily in the UK, uh, some artists. Back then, it, it was simply what most NFTs did. It was, it was really just some artwork or a JPEG, uh, not much utility. But we worked with some artists in the UK, um, some uh, actors such as uh, James Bond villain Stephen Burkoff uh, to sell. He sold a collection for uh, homeless people in, in LA. But it started off purely as an NFT marketplace. But then we have morphed it into adding in like 
you know, most people now uh, utility around them. We're concentrating on climate uh, and we are now uh, looking to help use the platform to raise funds for those working on the ground and those uh, working to help combat climate change and work towards the UN Biodiversity 2030 goals. So you're talking about the products that you, that you want to bring to market. Can you tell us a little bit more about them? Yeah, absolutely. We are creating a range of what we call mini biomes. So they are, for want of a better phrase, still an NFT, but they have transparency around them. They have impact. They have a provable positive impact on the planet. And that could be anything from planting a tree to building a well, buying books for a school, all of which are packaged up into an orb. Biome in, in the real world is a large area defined by its habitat and species. We're condensing it down into either single, much more transparent impacts. So yeah, as I said, from, from planting a tree. We've designed those to be put through the Hedera Guardian. So there's a workflow around them. So each party to that has a part to play. So whether that's the monitoring and verification, whether that's the audit, the data and so on. And then we built them designed specifically so they can be used in corporate rewards programs uh, and in games. As an example, you might be able to, as an employee of a firm, get one of the, get given one of these for attending uh, a certain workshop uh, or completing certain courses uh, or for, for, you know, for retailers for purchasing as you do in the real world with points. But we'd like to make them fungible with games as well. So wherever you collect them, whether you buy them, you collect them, whether you earn them, you can actually use them in games. And further to that, we'd like to use them between games. So as an example, if you collect a rhino shield in one game, why not be able to swap it or use it in another game? If that's not possible because the game doesn't have a shield or that type of item, we're working and we'd like to work with games on the Hedera ecosystem so that we're actually able to then swap it. But the impact remains the same. And when you swap and trade these items because they've got royalties attached, the benefits keep going to the user. Uh, sorry, the well, the user as well, but also the project on the ground. and. I think the ability to earn uh, and trade in-game items, I think, in general is very powerful. But then if you attach either a primary or secondary function around the environment, then I think it becomes even more powerful. And we're, we're working, uh, well, we, we're talking with various games within the Hedera ecosystem, as I said, for example, Earthlings, which I think your viewers hopefully will be uh, very familiar with. And, you know, ideas that we've, we've discussed with them are, for example, a well. You could have a well in their game or, or any game in, indeed, but their game. And every time someone, for example, throws a coin in the well, it goes towards building a, a real life well in Zambia or Zimbabwe. And then of course, once that well's completed, they can place that somewhere else within the game. Uh, having a watering hole, for example, in, in Earthlings as well. So there's a patch of water and there's animals all around it. Why not have those animals be real life animals. You know, we have projects that are protecting rhinos, tigers, leopards, cheetahs, uh, not, but not just the apex predators, you know, sloths, zebras, uh, wildebeest, and so on. So the mini biomes represent the ability for gamers to collect them in game. They can represent uh, mini environments. So uh, you have to complete certain quests and you get the uh, these power-ups. They can be anything from mangroves, as I said, but they can also be actual in-game items from the game. But why not have uh, the, the animals around the watering hole as real life animals? And as and when the game is within that, either purchase more of that particular biome or contribute some way through the game, uh, why not introduce more? So we're able to actually then expand out. You know, we plant in another thousand trees. Therefore, there's a new area in the game. So we, we'd like to make them fungible, as I said, with corporations. They're all real life transparent impacts because obviously being created through the Hedera Guardian, there's a whole transparency around that. It's cheap and easy to transact in them. There's not the horrendous gas fees that you get uh, on other uh, on other networks. And they can be used in games, but also hopefully between games. And we are talking to games around that. And we'd love to become the platform where we can actually help games make items, not just environmental items, but incidentally other items, you know, interoperable between them so that you can so the user only has to pay once but the game and the developers still can earn revenue from secondary sales through the royalty so that's that's what we're building um and we are at the early stages of that you know we are talking to games we have created them we have got projects on the ground uh, and we have got partnerships 
uh, being established or already established. I mean, this, I, I have to confess, I did know about the Earthlings collaboration. I knew that there was some work going on uh, behind the scenes. This is really what Web3 is supposed to be all about. You know, we already have Earthlings that's building a beautiful gaming metaverse. How much sense does it make to have the forest that's in front of you be a real reforested forest or the sidekick animal that you have next to you be a real wolf in the Yellowstone or, or wherever it may be? And I mean, I, I didn't know about the, the, the wells, but that makes perfect sense as, as well. So uh, this is something that's going to change not just the gaming industry, not just Web3, but conservation as well, don't you think? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I mean, to your point, and whilst it's a great idea in solitude on its own, I think that the greatest power of Web3 is being able to then translate that to other parts of your uh, life or your gaming. I mean, for example, wouldn't it be great if you didn't have to restart from the beginning if you reloaded up a new game or if you just joined a new game? Maybe you could bring in some of your assets from Earthlings or as some of the other games on Hedera, such as Yamgo and Asheville, for example, why not? If you start that sudden, you've got a coat that you've, you've earned through, you know, another platform, but, but why not do that? And I think it will change. That's one of the great powers, obviously, of Web3 is rewards and gamification of, of actions you've taken. I mean, countless times in games, you have to load them up. You've got to grind away, you get assets. Uh, and then you can't do anything with them. You can't sell them, you can't trade them. And it would be great to do that. And I think that's the greatest power of Web3. But I think picking up on what you were just saying there, I think it's a huge benefit to conservation. I mean, 75% of people um, interviewed by Fidelity Charity, which is one of the largest charity uh, funds in the world, said that they, young people, I should say, they uh, see themselves as philanthropists, but 50% said they didn't trust charities. So it's an obvious next step. So, well, how can we improve transparency? How can we improve the level of trust? And, and obviously blockchain, and using this type of asset is one of the is one of the best ways that I think. I think fundamentally over the next three or four years, you will see an end to unrestricted funding and people will demand to see where their money's going. And if you can track them through, you know, our assets or other assets right to fruition, then you can then layer in other technologies such as LIDAR scanning, remote sensing, satellite imagery, and actually say, well, hang on a second, we said we're going to build a well and here it is. Click on it, go and see it. Because the other great thing about the mini biomes is that we're attaching benefits to them. So if you create Collect 10, for example, and we work with each individual corporation and game around this, but if you collect 10, and let's say you have one apex predator, two herbivores and, and five trees, then maybe you can name a tree. Maybe you can go on, a, a, you know, maybe then you get into a lottery for a free safari. Maybe you can, you know, name the animal, get exclusive access to webcams talk directly to the project, because one of the greatest frustrations as well is that you're very aloof from the project. So you can then layer in all of these benefits, but but collected not just from one place. You know, it can be aggregated from corporations, games, platforms. You know, if we create a game, it's not just us giving them out. You know, we'd love to work with 20 people giving them out. And then maybe if I collect a mangrove tree on my platform, but a well on Earthlings, then suddenly I've got 100 points and then I can name the well. And that well is actually in Zambia. So all sorts of things can be built in. Uh, I think it's very rewarding. I think it's going to change the funding model. I think funding is, as we just said, one of the greatest strengths of Web3, and it would change the way conservation uh, is funded. I, um, I genuinely be particularly for smaller projects, because it's very hard for small projects to stand out. There's a huge vacuum of funding that goes up into WWF and Born Free and all of these big players. But the smaller people that are making a difference on the ground, that maybe have smaller holdings or smaller areas or smaller number of animals, they sometimes miss out. And I genuinely believe that this technology and these types of platforms can help change that, you know, forever in the next few years. Duncan, it's a fantastic initiative. Thank you so much for stopping by and good luck. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, Zep, this is one of my favorite collaborations so far. I know we're going to see a lot more collaborations going forward, but I was just really happy to see Aniseed and Earthlings come together here. Do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think the, you know, the funny comparison you can make is between when you, you look at a network like Axie Infinity or look at a network Ethereum that had Axie Infinity and you had all the environmentalists, all the gamers that were so put off by the carbon footprint of Ethereum, of, you know, the, the rocketing carbon footprint after that game. And you compare that to Hedera where we have refi projects, i.e. sustainability projects actively, actively trying to join our gaming ecosystem. 
And I think that just highlights the biggest contrast that is very telling that we have a gaming ecosystem that is so sustainable, i.e. because of the hash graph, that even sustainability projects want to participate. And, you know, to me, that is the, the biggest contrast that we could see between us and, and other ledgers. And of course, why we have a lot of builders moving towards us. And also, hopefully, in that, you know, because of that, a lot of gamers, once they learn about the hash graph, you know, that biggest FUD piece that they have, i.e. sustainability, or one of the biggest FUD pieces, doesn't exist on Hedera. So yeah, from an educational standpoint, I think that's, you know, that's it's very important. Yeah, great points across the board. And and really th that those collaborations come down to having a big, broad ecosystem of providers of services across the board, whether it's infrastructure, whether it's games, whether it's finance and things along those lines, payments. And a big part of building out those ecosystem are, are things like hackathons. And we had a really important hackathon this past week. Can you tell us about it? As part of the Tribe Web3 Accelerator, they had an educational program and halfway through this complete program is where we are now, i.e. the hackathon. And this hackathon is done with Angel, who are, you know, they're a big industry player when it comes to these kind of hackathons. They've partnered with Dell, MasterCard, IBM, Binance, Meta, most of the big companies in the world that are within tech. And so as sort of precedent there, I would think that this is probably our highest sort of tier hackathon so far, both in terms of the people driving behind it and also, one would hope, the, the sort of ecosystem of developers that Angel has attracted. Uh, so definitely excited to see where that one goes and, and excited to meet the team members that, that emerge. There's been amazing teams that have come out of these hackathons. For a great example of that, the very first hackathon that took place, the Hashback team came out of that. Now, it took them a few years to actually bring a product to market. But when they did, of course, they made a huge impact on our space. All right. We also have a really good team that is entering the Hedera space in NFT. -er. They are providing different infrastructure in the NFT space. So I talked to Michael. He's uh, one of the core founders. So take a listen to what he has to say. Michael, can you explain to us what NFT -er brings to the NFT space? Yeah, absolutely, Brandon. So NFT -er is an all-in-one tool for Hedera NFT collectors. It consists of a launch pad, uh, which is based on smart contracts. I think we were one of the first to introduce smart contracts as part of the minting process. We have a rarity engine, which is our default feature set that we offer on all of the EVM compatible chains that we work with and uh, before we came to Hedera as well. And we've always been improving on that functionality where you can track your rarity from our Chrome extension, our uh, iOS and Android app, and of course, the web. We have our print shop, which enables you to take your NFTs that you have and print them onto stickers, canvases, and t-shirts dynamically if you do own those NFTs. And lastly, the product that we're most excited about recently is our NFT or advanced analytics. Advanced analytics is kind of like your gateway into the world of uh, Hedera NFTs. It allows you as a collector to browse metrics from the 3,000 plus tokens that we've indexed from the hash graph, where you can see the, you know, in the simplest terms, the value of your NFT portfolio collections that are minting right now, the holders of collections, current listings, sales, and more. It's really about giving you actionable insights um, so that when you're buying and selling or minting NFTs, you're not doing it blindly. Um, I think as a lot of traders do, you, when you're getting involved in NFTs, you're doing it from your heart, you like the art for some reason, you're attracted to the utility of the game. And, you know, a lot of times we maybe we spend more than we should be, or maybe we're selling below what we actually bought it for originally. And through advanced analytics, you can actually get all that information so you can make more data-driven decisions in your day-to-day -day, um, NFT trading, selling, minting, et cetera. Michael, that sounds like a really powerful set of tools. So what is unique about the Hedera NFT ecosystem that drew you to it? And, and where do you see this space going in the years to come? The unique ad for me initially had nothing to do with the community or how profitable it is or not profitable it is more had to do with the technology that Hedera has. Where Hedera is unique is we have this thing that folks call the native layer, where you have tokens 
that, that actually live on the network level. For a lot of us that came from the EVM world, this is a brand new concept where everything in the EVM world is behind some kind of smart contract uh, like an ERC-721. The closest equivalent to that on Hedera is a, a token on the Hedera token service. The fact that I can go through an API, pull all this data, and create these tokens as first-class citizens was insanely attractive and interesting, where it it's a tangible thing. It feels a lot more tangible than a smart contract in some ways. And of course, Hedera still has smart contracts as well, which enabled our trustless programmat uh, programmatic logic, which we have within our smart contracts on our launchpad. But the fact that you've got these native things, that was the key selling point. We had a collection reach out to us, and that's how we came into Hedera, asking if we could do the rarity for the collection. It was the H brains, I believe. And when they had asked, our response was, you know, I don't know if we can. I've never heard of this Hedera thing. Um, and but we said, we, we'll try to integrate it. We'll take a look. Um, two hours later, we had our first rarity listing up for a Hedera collection. It was that easy because you could query these things without spinning up a node. It all just lives on the network itself. That was the selling point for us, the technology layer, how easy it was to deal with. So ease of use, good stuff. So is there anything else that potential users of your platform should know? I think for us, the biggest thing is right now we've got everything integrated through our utility collections. We've got a collection called the Woke Fence, which has done phenomenally well, minted at 600 HBAR, and it's now selling for close to 2,000 HBAR right now. And by owning a Woke Fence, you get access to our advanced analytics. You get access to our creator tools. Each Woke Fence gives you um, one Discord bot that you can set up. You get allow us access to our mints, where a lot of holders have made, gotten a lot of free mints even from holding a Woke Fems. And if you can't afford the Woke Fems, we also have the Data Bots collection, which is a little bit cheaper. The Data Bots collection is interesting because it's kind of rechargeable, where you get some of the same things that the Woke Fems does, but you recharge it for a 285 H bar a month. The really cool thing about that collection is we. I think had some of the first cases of mutable metadata uh, using smart contracts on Hedera because when you recharge your data bot, you actually burn the original one and you get back a new one in a single wrap transaction through our smart contract where instead of the old version, it has like this word on top of it. It'll either be claimed or recharged. And every time you recharge, you're getting a new serial number back. But while you're recharging, you don't have to send it to a treasury account. There's no manual effort, no metadata keys. It's all using the existing technology in Hedera through the supply key where you execute the smart contract, you get a new serial back that's recharged and ready uh, to continue your subscription. Another cool thing that we recently worked on, we're going to actually be um, improving a lot in the very near future, are our watch list alerts. So our watch list alerts enable you to monitor the floor price of any collection and get a uh, notification through email, push, or Discord when the price moves. And that's payable through our fungible uh, tier token or HBAR at 0 0.05 tier or 0 0.05 HBAR per alert. Well, Michael, I, we really appreciate you building all this infrastructure for our creators, for our builders, and for our users. Thank you so much for stopping by and telling us about it. Yeah, Zep, I was really impressed with what Michael had to say, and he seems to really understand the tech. All right, so the next thing we're going to get into is Karate Combat. We talked about how they were going to have a lot of things coming out this week. We know that they're going to be doing an airdrop. I don't have all the information on the airdrop yet. I think they're holding off on putting that out so everybody has a fair access to it. But we are hearing a fair amount about the exchanges. What have you seen over the past few days with their announcement on centralized exchanges supporting the Karate token? Yeah, I think we've had about four centralized exchanges and at least two of those 
were not HTS before. Uh, and so if they are leveraging the HTS karate token there, then that, you know, that's, that's, that's great for us. And as I understand, the conversations are, are towards that integration. So you had MEXC, you had Bybit, Gates, IO, and I think also Bitfinex. Sort of the broad range of exchanges there, but all, all well-respected and all well-used. But I think what this really highlights for me is that from a business development point of view, Karate Combat has been a, a fantastic investment. You know, the foundation team identified this investment before the likes of Delphi Digital, before the likes of Bitcraft, and before this Series A fund round of $18 million. So that was an early call, and I think that was a fantastic call. But in terms of where it's allowing us to leverage now, we're seeing that coming into play. You know, Karate Combat has got from big VC, from other ecosystems, but you know they are tied to the Hedera ecosystem, of course. So now we're seeing Karate Combat sort of go in as our Trojan horse, opening up these exchanges, getting that conversation going, getting them to integrate the HTS. And of course, that makes it a lot easier for other projects down the line that want to get their tokens listed. And hopefully that'll boost liquidity throughout our ecosystem. So yeah, I think a great investment early on from the foundation. I'm sure we, we're, we're at the very start of you know the fruit that's going to come from it. Yep. And just came out right now. We just heard that KuCoin is also going to support the karate token. So that's great to see. We don't have the information on the exactly how to participate in the airdrop yet. But if we get that information throughout the day while I'm editing and getting this video ready, I'll try to do an extra clip to put it in there. If not, we'll make sure to cover it early next week. So as promised, Karate Combat has made their app live. It is in the App Store right now. So you can just go to the iOS App Store, search for Karate Combat. It's going to be under Karate Combat Vote Live. Install it on your phone. You're going to create account like you would for any other Hedera wallet, and you'll automatically get the Karate Combat airdrop. All right, so... Talking about the HTS support coming through Karate Token, that's fantastic on these centralized exchanges, but we're still getting additional on-ramps for the HBAR as well. So we have a DEX that's going to be supporting HBAR, and that's Proton, and we also had on Meta that's going to support us as well. You know, we've had, unfortunately, because of the regulatory environment in the U.S., we've lost Bittrex in the U.S. We still have some really big ones. We have Coinbase and we have Binance U.S. Uh, supporting the U.S. customers, uh, but we are losing some because of the regulatory environment, or at least we lost one big one very recently. So what are your thoughts on these additional exchanges that are supporting HBAR? So alongside Proton Dex, we also saw on Meta come out with their fiat on and off ramp in the APAC region. And of course, you know, one of the key parts of any DeFi ecosystem is the ability for users to A, put fiat in, but also take it out. And I don't know if there's any integration there yet, but Heliswap Dex is from Hong Kong. So maybe we'll see some kind of integration there and that'll make the user experience easier as a whole. But you know, either way, it's great to see another company supporting our ecosystem like that. And I know that they've been working closely with Blade Wallet and, and uh, Alice from the foundation. So hopefully, you know, that's the start of a, a, a blossoming relationship there. Yeah, without a question, we know that region is going to be critical going forward, so it's good to see continued growth. All right, and the last thing before we get into network analysis is we caught up with Andrew from Tune FM. He is one of the OGs in the space. They have uh, some new support for NFTs on their marketplace, so check it out. Andrew, Tune FM has been around since day one in the Hedera space, but you have some new features coming live this week, and I wanted to make sure that they got highlighted. Can you tell us about them? Absolutely. We're really excited to launch the new music NFT marketplace within Tune FM. So we've been working on this for over a year. And essentially what we've done is we've vertically integrated a music NFT marketplace within the decentralized music streaming platform. So you can actually enjoy the music NFTs where you buy them. So that's really important because right now, if you buy a music NFT somewhere else, it's just a standalone player and you can't really enjoy it like you would listening to Spotify or SoundCloud. So what we've done is create a marketplace to for artists to mint their music NFTs. And what those are, multi-tiered, multi-file, multimedia NFTs in which they can even attach unlockable perks. So we have a token gated unlockable perks feature where artists can include VIP experiences, backstage passes, these real life experiences with artists uh, that you can buy on auction or on the marketplace. One really cool feature of Tune FM is when you mint a music NFT and you play the song, when the music gets played, the artist gets paid. 
but as an NFT collector, you can buy an NFT with a portion of those streaming royalties attached to the NFT. So you can earn alongside the artist and participate in the upside um, of a song doing really well on Tune FM. So because artists can earn up to 100 times more on Tune FM than they do on Spotify, it's very powerful to, as an NFT collector to be able to also earn instantly just by owning a piece of the NFT streaming royalties. So that's a really cool feature that we baked into the music NFT platform that artists can attach any portion, any percentage of their streaming royalties to any tier of the NFT. Yeah, that is exciting. So one of the things that I've heard people leveraging NFTs across the space, they're really getting into, you know, that dynamic nature and the multi files. And you mentioned that as well. Can you go into some more detail? Absolutely. So we've built a really robust self-service platform in which artists can do multi-tier drops. And so what that means is that they can stack multiple NFTs together as part of a single drop. So they could have a one of one, a 10 of 10, 100 of 100, and have different perks and different files and different media attached to those NFTs. So in any one of those tiers, they can have not just one song, they can have an entire album, they can have the album art, they can have the the video, the music video, or any other animations or artwork that they want to include with that music NFT. So you can really bundle a whole suite of digital assets with a single token. Uh, and that's really a groundbreaking thing that I think plays really well for the music industry. Yeah, th that's for sure. And right now, if somebody wanted to get involved, how would they go about that? So all they have to do is go to tune.fm and sign up and start playing around. And some of the artists that are creating these NFTs, do you, do you have any names you can drop? Absolutely. So our the first big drop in our platform is by an artist named Luciana, who's a nine-time number one Billboard EDM artist, also known as the Queen of Electro. And she has some really exciting drops in the platform. And we have many more celebrity A-list artists to come. Andrew, thank you so much for swinging by and telling us about it. Thanks. I appreciate it. All right. It's great to see what Tune FM is doing, but now let's get into some network analysis. Looking at the transaction volume over the past 24 hours, we are over 60 million transactions and we had a bit of a dip that happens on a regular basis. So I got like four or five DMS yesterday, mm -hmm. wondering why our transaction volume had dipped. It's just when at is going through a shift or, you know, they have to recharge their, their fee account or something along those lines, but it came right back. And right now we are humming along at just under 1000 transactions per second. We've had a max TPS really close to a record at 70 at 7,200 transactions per second. Have you been following any of this up? Uh, I mean, you know, I've been, I think, what was it last week? There was 81 million transactions in a day. It's, it's funny when we go back to like, say, 80 TPS or something, because that, that's an order of magnitude of where we were however many months ago, you know, six, seven months ago. So we sort of did two orders of magnitude to get to where we are now. And, you know, that, that to me is just insane. And the fact that when we drop down to something like 80 TPS is now seen as like incredibly slow even though that's what sort of six times more than you know, our nearest competitor. So yeah, it, it, exciting to see that, you know, that, that that's come up again. But of course, Atmo.io is going to have ebbs and flows and we caught one of the, the ebbs yesterday. And all of that with time to consensus staying under five seconds. So really impressive there. And we've had some good account growth over the past week, haven't we? Yeah. So I mean, over the past month in particular, we've had what, 176,600 accounts created. So 43% increase on last month and going by Jeep top down, who's, you know, one of our valued community members in Telegram, he said that the most of these accounts came from Zenny, which is of course our decentralized traveling network and also road code, which is our web three recycling division, but also that there's been a spike recently that he hasn't found out what it is yet, but I imagine it's got something to do with the karate token, the exchanges and so on and so forth. So on the last month, yeah, 43% increase. And then on the last week, we're up 32% with 83,000 accounts this week. You know, maybe a month, month and a half, two months ago, we we're talking about how, you know, 3,000 accounts a day is great. You know, we're way above that at the moment. So hopefully we'll keep this momentum up. And moving down to our fungible tokens, we see Xbox, Wrapped HBAR, Sauce, Dovu, Heliswap, and USDC all in the top 10. I'm expecting next week that we're going to see Karate Combat pretty high on that list. And I'm also going to be doing another interview next week with Aniseed because they're talking about doing a fungible token as well. 
And moving down to our non-fungible tokens, of course, Ashfall is always in the top 10. We have our naming services up there. We have Elfu, the cosmetics company, still in the top 10, like usual. Uh, any other thoughts on NFTs this week? Dead Pixels have announced their onesies. So if you're a Dead Pixels holder, go onto their site or rather their Twitter page and see if your ghost is eligible to be traded in for an ultra rare onesie or a golden ghost. So very exciting this week. I haven't got any yet, unfortunately, but if you are, you could be the lucky holder. So go and check. All right, good stuff. And with that, we'll go ahead and get into DeFi. Remember, none of this is financial advice. We're just highlighting what's happening in the Hedera DeFi ecosystem. Before participating, ensure you're following all local laws and regulations. Looking at DeFi Llama, not including state or liquid staking, we've broken below $30 million total value locked. And at the time of recording, we're sitting at about $27.5 million. SaucerSwap TVL has dropped 11% this week to $18 million. Pangolin is down 10% to $7.3 million. And Heliswap is off the most, down nearly 15% to just over $2 million total value locked. Much, if not all, this move can be attributed to the drop in token values. Looking at the returns on some of SaucerSwap's popular trading pairs, the APR on HBAR HBAR X is about 14%, 30% on HBAR Sauce, and 31% on HBAR USDC. Over on Pangolin, we have 27% on HBAR HBAR X, 70% on HBAR USDC, and still an impressive 245% on HBAR PBAR. It's been a while since we covered Stator, so let's take a look. The annual return you'll get by holding HBAR X is at about 9%, and of course this is accrued in HBAR, so that's about 2.5% above native staking. An HBAR X is worth about 25% more than an HBAR. Said another way, if you participated in Stator liquid staking from the beginning, you've gained about 25% more HBAR. Finally, the total value locked on Stator is sitting just below a half a billion HBAR. All right, let's take a look at the HBAR and crypto markets. Despite tamer inflation data midweek, risk assets, particularly crypto, have struggled. Bitcoin and ETH are both down about 11% on the week, Bitcoin is off 2% on the day, and ETH gave up a half a percent. Considering HBAR being down 12% on the week and up a bit on the day isn't that bad. At the time of recording, HBAR is sitting at about 5.1 cents. 5 cents is a key area of support, which might explain why we've held up well at this level. That said, if the broader crypto market continues to drop, it will likely break and we could easily see a dip to 4.5 cents. If we bounce, expect resistance at 5.4 and 5.8 cents. All right, Zep, that's pretty much all we have. Is there anything else you'd like to pass on? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the most telling things this week is, is what we discussed at the start, which is, you know, Hedera is the only network in Web3 at the moment that has proven itself to be able to scale on the mainnet. Lots of people can do a lot of things on the testnet, but that's not the real world. We know that Hedera can consistently handle above 800 TPS. We know that the fixed fees obviously do not change in that time. We know that hasn't been any congestion. We just know for a fact that Hedera can scale further than any other network so far. And so when you're an institution and you, you see the news and you see that Ethereum's gas prices has gone up or Bitcoin's congested and you, you're looking for a serious alternative, Hedera is the only one up there that is truly, truly performing at the moment. And of course, you know, this is all by design. You know, the hash graph is built to scale. The governing council is there as the secure factor for businesses to allow their applications to scale and so on and so forth. So for me, it's just we're, we are leagues ahead of the competition at the moment by, you know, data, you know, the facts on mainnet. And I hope that a lot of institutions are, are taking, you know, insight from this. And of course, you know, when we look back at the last few weeks we've covered, we saw that the World Economic Forum shouted out the, the Hedera Guardian. You, we know that Nelmini's been at Congress. We know that we're part of the state democracy with, you know, with the government of the US itself. We know that there's a lot of serious actors looking at Hedera and we know that we are proving to them that we are the best alternative to, to other networks like Ethereum or, or Bitcoin, whatever it is. Um, so hopefully uh, that will only continue. And of course, the big news this week has been Karate Combat. And uh, we're going to see them launch their app. We're going to see the Karate token launch. And hopefully we're going to see a lot more from them in, in the future. So all around a, a good week.
Yeah, it was a great week and well said. We have another exciting week next week. I'm going to get Delon. He is the main business development rep with the HBAR Foundation who works with Karate Combat. We're going to have him on. We're going to get Aniseed on to talk about their fungible token. We are going to hopefully get Neuron as well. And they're doing some really cool stuff with Internet of Things. Also Red Swan. So it's going to be a packed episode next week. Thank you guys for stopping by and we'll see you next week.